correction officers, a serving police officer, parents, neighbors, and friends. The full scope of this tragedy and the 18 innocent lives that were lost will be remembered for, throughout Canada's history. One of the particularly tragic elements of this terrible event was the death of Constable Heidi Stevenson, who was killed answering the call to duty while bravely responding to this tragic incident. Constable Stevenson was a 23-year veteran of the RCMP, admired, respected, and beloved by her colleagues and her community. I also want to acknowledge Constable Chad Morrison, who is recovering today from gunshot wounds in which that he suffered in responding bravely to this event. I think all Canadians are grateful that we have people like Constable Stevenson, Constable Morrison, men and women serving in law enforcement across the country who answer the call, who rush towards the danger, who put their lives on the line. And it is important to remember that they are heroes every day, not just made heroes by this terrible tragedy, but every day for their service. And we will remember their sacrifice. The Nova Scotia RCMP are actively investigating almost 16, I believe, 16 crime scenes, and they will be releasing information as it becomes available. I can tell you from experience that in these incredibly complex and tragic crimes, what is known now will be added to. It, the information will be incomplete. And the RCMP, the RCMP are doing an extraordinary job of tracking the evidence, getting the facts, dealing with families who are grieving an incredible loss, and they are dealing with all of that while they mourn the loss of a beloved con uh, colleague. Last night, I had this opportunity to speak with MPs from Nova Scotia who I serve with, Lenore Zahn, Darren Fisher, Bernadette Jordan, and I've asked them all to help us understand how the Government of Canada can best support their communities at this tragic time. And we will continue to work together to get through this. We will continue to support the RCMP in the important and vital work that they are doing to get Canadians, Canadians the answers that they seek. I've also had the opportunity this morning to speak with Nova Scotia's Attorney General and Minister of Justice, Mark Furry. You know, Mark and I used to work together when he was then serving with the RCMP. And he spoke about his recollection of Constable Stevenson. He was involved in her recruitment and hiring and training. And it was very apparent to me how deeply, emotionally and impactful this tragedy has been for him as well. And so I would like to take this opportunity to sincerely thank the members of Nova Scotia's RCMP and the Commissioner who serve our communities every day. As Canadians, we have no greater responsibility than the safety of our communities and our kids. I'd also like to take this opportunity to express my heartfelt condolences to the people of Porto Peak, to the region of, of central Nova Scotia that has been so deeply impacted by the lives that have been stol stolen in this senseless act of violence. And I'd like now to turn to Commissioner Lucky to make her remarks. Commissioner. Good afternoon. Our hearts are broken. My heart is broken. Um, a senseless act of violence unprecedented in our country has occurred. Um, I want to thank all of the people across Canada and across the world who have uh, shared their expressions of grief, sorrow, support and condolences as we mourn the loss of Constable Heidi Stevenson as well as families across Nova Scotia and their loved ones. And we are all families. Heidi served in her community. Her children went to school in the community, as uh, does Chad Morrison. In the face of this unprecedented crime, it's going to be very long and very complicated. Um, it's not going to be uh, gone through overnight. As the minister said, there's 15, at least 15 crime scenes. But our focus must and will be to put names to the victims to the heroes, to the people who serve their community. 
And again, on behalf of the RCMP family, I want to thank the minister, the media, and all the Canadians for such a tremendous support throughout this. And it means so much to us. I will end by saying Canadians are resilient. COVID showed us our resiliency. This event will again show our resiliency. And we will get through this. We'll get through this together. Thank you. Merci, euh, la ministre Blair, et euh, merci à commissaire Lucky d'être euh, avec nous aujourd'hui. Aujourd'hui, nous partageons euh, cette grande peine sharing this tremendous avec, euh, tragedy and this en fin de semaine, des actes grieving de with the people of Nova Scotia. Senseless crimes took place in port peak and in the environs, and I am entirely behind the families who received the worst call of their lives yesterday. There's no way to describe this loss and tragedy. I offer my sincere condolences and those of all Canadians to the families, to the loved ones of the victims. So here is the the information that we can share with you at this point. 18 precious lives have been lost, including an officer of the RCMP. Constable Heidi Stevenson was mowed down as she was carrying out her duties. This hero was a veteran of 23 years in the RCMP. We also hope uh, that uh, the other constable of the RCMP who was injured, Mr. Chad Morrison, that he gets back on his feet quickly. It is too early to know the numbers of people who may have died because we're constantly assessing this. We know that close ones, loved ones, nurses, and others who contributed to their communities may have died, and so we are with those communities. The RCMP in Nova Scotia is carrying out its investigation in the various locations of the various crimes and will express all the information required as it becomes available. In the meantime, I would ask Canadians to be united in their grief in support of these communities that have been hardly hit. And I would like to thank the members of the RCMP in Nova Scotia who are serving courageously their communities on a daily basis. As a government, we have no greater responsibility than to ensure uh, the safety and security of Canadians. And once again, I would like to express my sincere condolences to the people of Port Epic and to those people who have lost loved ones in a senseless act of violence. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. We'll now start taking questions, starting with three questions on the phone. On va commencer à prendre les questions en commençant par le téléphone. Trois questions au téléphone avant de se tourner vers la salle. One question, one follow-up, une question, un suivi. Opérateur. Thank you, merci. Please press star one at this time if you have a question. S'il vous plaît, appuyez sur étoile 1 maintenant pour poser une question. The first question, la première question. Steve Scherer, Reuters. Please go ahead, your line is open. À vous la parole, votre ligne est ouverte. Hello, yes. Um, I wanted to ask, I know that uh, the other press conference, one in Nova Scotia, indicated that the, the death toll may not be final. I was wondering if you have an idea of how many people may be missing right now. Um, at this time, we don't have an exact number. We just know that there are certain scenes that have not been processed. And because of fire, it's not easily apparent if uh, all the people are, have been accounted for. Okay, can I can I follow up? Yes. Um, my my follow up would be: ha Have you been able to um, to find out whether uh, the attacker left any sort of note? Uh, at all before uh, before going on this rampage? Uh, no note has been found to date. Thank you. Thank next you. question on the phone. Thank you, merci. The next question, the prochaine question, Danielle Leblanc from Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Vous la parole. 
Hello, it's a question for uh, Mr. Blair. Uh, the Prime Minister has talked about um, legislation on gun control. Um, there's also been raised the possibility of not going through the legislative process. Um, can you give us a sense of whether you're still looking at a possible order in Council to enact uh, the promised uh, ban on assault weapons? Our government's been very clear in its commitment to strengthen gun control in Canada, and we have been working diligently on the best way to achieve uh, the, the strengthening of both our regulations and the legislation um, pertaining to uh, firearms and making Canada a safer place. Um, but, but today, quite frankly, we focus on the grieving families of, of this terrible tragedy and, and provide support to the RCMP in the conduct of their investigation. Uh, we'll continue to, to do the work of Parliament, but today our focus really is on that support that is uh, so necessary for the, for the communities, for people who have lost loved ones, and for the RCMP who are doing very important work today. Monsieur Leblanc, okay. um, a follow-up for Commissioner Lucky. Uh, can you give us a sense of the firearms that were used, whether or not they were registered, uh, whether they were, you know, they were properly obtained, um, and give us a sense of what you know on that front? There is still a lot of work to be done in regards to the various firearms that have been used in this crime spree, um, and I don't have that information. Uh, we will be doing a lot of tracing. We'll be doing a lot of uh, background work into that. But to date, we don't have that information. Thank you, Commissioner. Operator, next question on the phone. Thank you. Merci. The next question, the prochaine question, is from Jim Brunskill from the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Have la parole. Votre ligne est ouverte. Uh, yes, for Minister Blair, uh, do you have a, a timeline on when the gun control measures will be brought in? The, there are renewed calls today from uh, people who would like to see these uh, public interest measures in place. You know, as, I, as I've indicated, Jim, we have been working very diligently on fulfilling our commitment to Canadians to bring forward uh, regulation and legislation to strengthen gun control in this country. Um, as I, I think all Canadians are aware, there has been a fairly significant interruption of Parliament and parliamentary processes over the past week uh, in response to the virus, but that doesn't in any way um, lessen our commitment to bringing forward effective measures that will keep communities safe and, and as we have committed to do strengthen uh, gun laws in this country. Um, but we are also working through complex parliamentary processes, and, and much of that is uh, resolving itself today. Jim, follow-up. Uh, follow-up for Commissioner Lucky. Um, and forgive me if this has been addressed, but uh, was uh, the individual uh, involved in these uh, terrible acts, what, what, was he known to police, to RCMP, uh, in any, uh, I know he was no, well known in the community, but was he known to police in any way before these acts? So. Uh, the subject in question was not well known to police. Thank you, Commissioner. We'll now start taking questions in the room, starting with Catherine from CBC. Hi there. Uh, I think this question is for Minister Blair, but Commissioner Lucky, if you'd like to comment as well. Um, the news conference we just heard from the RCMP in Nova Scotia referenced two additional inf uh, investigations by the Serious Incident Response Team. We're trying to understand, were there civilians or other members of the police who might have been fired upon in this incident? It wasn't clear who, who these incidents involved. Can you just shed a bit of light on whether or not... Uh uh, whenever there is a use of force by police, uh, the independent investigators of any province will do an investigation. So it's based on uh, use of force uh, by the RCMP. And that's all I can uh, comment on. Uh, there's two specific incidents um, that they've been requested to investigate. But you can't tell the public that no civilians were, <clears throat> no, no bystanders, you're, you're not ruling that out? Um, no, it, it's with the RCMP. Uh, it's not. Uh, no innocent civilians have been uh, harmed in this in these use of uh, force incidents. If I could just 
add, squeeze one more question in there. Uh, a question that's been raised is about the fact that while there was information sent out on Twitter, there was no sort of public alert sent out through the telephone over the course of um, over the course of this incident. And I wonder if that's something that you're looking into now. If you if you have any questions about whether that might have uh, helped preserve public safety. I do say that in any incident such as this, we always have to look back at what we did. Uh, nobody can lose their life in vain, and Heidi will not lose her life in vain, nor will the 17 other victims. We have to ensure that whatever happened there, if there's always going to be a better way to do things. And so if we can take this and move forward and find a better way to um, to advise the public. But I have to say, in these incidents, they are so dynamic and they are so quick. And it was just over 12 hours that all of this took place. And it was, uh, there was a lot of 15 different crime scenes. So you can imagine the dynamic uh, nature of this. But again, we look at all the criminal side. And then, of course, we look at sort of the administrative side of all of that to say, what could we have done better to make Canadians safer? Because that is ultimately our goal. Ian Woods, CTV. Ian Woods. Ian Woods, CTV News. Um, Minister Blair, uh, with respect to the victims and not to take away from them, I, I do want to return to gun control legislation. Um, Following the attack in New Zealand last year, the New Zealand government uh, was very swift in um, working to reduce the number of guns that they had in their communities, uh, assault weapons. Uh, likewise, Australia did the same thing following a mass shooting there in 1995, moved quite quickly. Um, you said it's still on the table, it's still on the agenda, but just exactly how and when is this going to be brought up and in this new reduced COVID parliament that we have? Yeah, there are a number of, of significant steps, and in, in what we have previously indicated is our intention to strengthen gun control legislation. We, we are, intend to bring forward um, both regulation and legislation that will enable us to prohibit it, um, military style assault weapons. We've also are working on new legislation that will strengthen uh, gun storage rules to prevent the diversion of firearms into the hands of people that would commit crimes with them and to reduce the incidence of smuggling of firearms across the border. We've also uh, are, are, are intending to bring forward legislation to introduce what, what are sometimes referred to as red flag laws for, for individuals who represent a significant risk to themselves or to others to ensure that they don't have access to firearms and, and to suspend spend temporarily their, their ability to acquire firearms. That work has been continuing. We, we are highly motivated by our commitment to keep Canadians safe. There, there have been far too many incidents of gun violence in our country, and we are working hard to make sure that we do put the measures in place that significantly reduce those incidents and keep people safe. Of course, we're deeply impacted by the terrible crimes that have taken place over the past uh, 36 hours. But at the same time, I think it's very important to allow the RCMP to conduct their investigation, to gather the evidence and the facts. And, and our, our public policy should be evidence-based and will be evidence-based. And so we will support the RCMP in the conduct of their investigation. I think we've made it very clear, a commitment to strengthen gun laws in this country, and we are working on doing that. Um, the, the, the actual schedule for bringing forward that legislation um, that is, is still to be determined simply because we are in somewhat uncertain times in Parliament. But it doesn't in any way uh, imply that we are any less committed to taking the steps that are necessary to keep Canadians safe, to strengthen our gun laws, and, and, and to do those things which Canadians expect of us and which are necessary to maintain safety and reduce gun violence in our communities. Thank you. Um Commissioner Lucky, uh, condolences to you and the force. Um, I just want to ask, the, the suspect had a mock RCMP vehicle and was wearing RCMP paraphernalia. How does someone obtain this, put it together? Do we watch for this, and was he on our radar? 
Uh, for that, he wasn't on our radar, uh, as far as we know. But there's a lot of investigative steps that have already been followed to tra trace all of that back and how it did happen and how it could occur. Uh, some of it, uh, m most of which we think is replica. Um, uh, it wasn't actually an RCMP vehicle, uh, but it was made to look identical to one. And we will trace back every part of that vehicle to find out how that happened, as well as with the uniforms. Hi, uh, Tim Noam, it's iPolitics. I just got to say that I'm really sorry for your losses and also to the people of Nova Scotia. Um, with regard to the firearm, although you might not, and I know that in previous shootings that the police have not released details of the firearm that was used, partly because of a trial, which there isn't going to be one here, and continuing investigation, but I'm just wondering, without actually specifying a make or a model, uh, could you say, uh, inform us whether these we this weapon or weapons were restricted or prohibited, or were they non-restricted? And did the, the shooter have a firearm license? With regards to the various weapons used, uh, what we will do is, because there's 15 different crime scenes, and despite what the suspect may or may not have had, we have to determine at each location uh, what weapon was used, um, determine if a wep uh, if it was a long arm or if it was a uh, handgun. And until we know exactly uh, the cause of each death, uh, I would be—we're not in a position to say um, what types of weapons they—that the suspect was in possession of. Uh, we're still—there's uh, still a lot of uh, scenes to uh, to process, and we're not sure that what, what we may have right in front of our eyes is usually not what— mm what ends up happening. So we have to make sure that we, we are, as uh, Chief Superintendent Leather said, we are conducting searches. Uh, there's still some searches to be done and to put some of those pieces together. Right. I think I understand, understand some of that, that, you know, you, you have to determine and establish that each and all of these weapons were used in or not in the shootings. But with regard to the firearm license, um, I, I wouldn't think that anything investigative would hinge on that. If you could release, tell us whether or not that individual did have or did not have a firearm license. Tim, as, as, as we've indicated, the RCMP are in the earliest hours and days of this investigation, and it's a complex one. And, and I think it's quite appropriate for them to be careful about the release of information until they've had the opportunity to verify it and confirm it. And, and so it, it is, I, I think, inappropriate, and the Commissioner would, would quite naturally be very reluctant to reveal details of that investigation until it is complete. And so I would urge Canadians to be patient with the RCMP as they do a very difficult but very important job for us in getting all the facts. In, in confirming their evidence, making sure that all of the steps to preserve that evidence are, are taken. Um, Canadians need to deserve answers. The families and the victims of these terrible crimes deserve accurate answers. And so let us be patient while the RCMP con conducts their investigation, confirms their evidence, and then I am absolutely confident they'll be transparent and, and, and forthcoming with that once that important work has been done. Okay, I understand that. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I will now turn back to the phone. Trois questions au téléphone, opérateur. Thank you. Merci. The uh, next question, la prochaine question, the Dylan Robertson from Winnipeg Free Press. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Have la parole. Uh, I want to express my condolences, and uh, I don't mean to distract from this tragedy, but I want to ask Minister Blair about the situation in our federal institutions with COVID. Uh, as far as I can tell, you haven't done any interviews since the pandemic hit the jails. We've seen ministers with less important portfolios show up at press conferences. We have a hashtag going around, where is Blair? And uh, I'm just wondering what you've been doing to keep abreast of the situation with COVID and prisoners. 
Uh, all right, I've, I've, I've been here every single day, actually, and working very closely with all of my officials, including uh, Commissioner Kelly, who I've spoken to as most recently as this morning, but almost a daily conversation with our correction officials. Um, I can assure Canadians that we have been, been taking um, a number of very significant steps to ensure the health and safety of the inmate population who we are responsible for. Uh, both Corrections Canada and the, our parole board have been working diligently for individuals who are eligible to be released and do not re represent a significant uh, threat to public safety, that they have been working to make sure that those individuals are considered for early release, and, and literally hundreds of people have, in fact, been, been, been placed back in the community. Uh, but that's done in a very careful and supervised way, to, because public safety is our first priority. Within the institutions themselves, um, our Correction Services Canada officials have been working very closely with Public Health Canada and with provincial uh, public health authorities to ensure that all of the measures that are necessary to protect our inmate populations are being taken, and that includes um, issuing protect personal protective equipment to both correction officers and the inmates in those institutions, that proper social isolation um, and, and social distancing uh, measures are being taken. Um, in all of the institutions where the, the virus is present, there have been essentially lockdowns uh, put in place to allow people to be isolated and distanced from others who are effective. Um, in addition, medical services are being provided and support is being provided to those who are suffering from this illness. I want to assure Canadians we take our responsibility to the safety of those inmates very, very seriously, but also to the safety of our communities. Um, our Correction Services and Pro Board have been working very diligently with public health officials to protect that, that vulnerable population and take the steps necessary uh, to, in, to ensure that we, we, we provide that protection and where the illness is present that the people receive the care and treatment and support that they need. And, uh, Minister, how many inmates have been released due to COVID-19, and how many have been transferred to hospitals? Okay, my, my understanding is that those who have required treatment in hospitals have been have been transferred there. I, the commissioner advises me that many of the people that have received that treatment are now back in the institutions having recovered, although there are a number of individuals still receiving treatment in hospital. Um, with respect to, to the release of, of prisoners, ap approximately 600 people become eligible for consideration for uh, parole and, and release, and, and the, the, the parole board has been working very diligently through um, th those those release provisions. As well, there are some individuals who are eligible for um, ex exceptional consideration for release as a result of medical conditions, those, for example, experiencing um, a complex uh, a pregnancy. And, and so th those measures have been taken. I don't have a precise number of the people um, that, that have been uh, entered into a, a community-based parole. Um, during this crisis, but I can tell you Correction Services Canada and the Parole Board of Canada have been working very, very hard to make sure that people who need additional protections and considerations are given such, and at the same time, they're applying their, their, their always due diligence in ensuring that people who are released are released in circumstances that allow uh, for safe reintegration and back into community. Merci, Monsieur le Ministre, opérateur. Prochaine question. Thank you, merci. The next question is from Charlie Pinkerton from iPolitics. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Votre ligne est ouverte. Hi there. Uh, this is for Minister Blair. Um, just wondering to clarify something. In whatever form we see Parliament take as it deals with the COVID-19 pandemic, will there be room um, for gun control legislation to be introduced, or will it have to wait until Parliament returns to normal sittings? It is my intention to bring forward that legislation as quickly as possible, and, but that has been our intention. Um, there, there has been an inter interruption in, in Parliament as a result of, of the, the, the COVID-19 provisions that have been put in place in Parliament, but at the very first opportunity, it is my intention to bring forward the measures that will fulfill our commitment to Canadians to strengthen gun control in Canada. Canada. Okay, and um, you know your government has said that about a few pieces of legislation, and there's certain other certain other priorities, including things like banning conversion therapy and making changes to medical assistance and dying. Uh, would this legislation be put ahead of that on the uh, list of priorities? No, I, I, quite, quite frankly, all of those things are priorities, and we're working diligently on on being prepared to bring that before Parliament at the appropriate time. Thank you, yeah, Minister. Thank you. One last question on the phone. Thank you, merci. The next question is from Jim Bronskill from the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. 
Uh, yes, Minister Blair, just, just to follow up on uh, Dylan's question about prisoners. Um, I realize you said you didn't have exact numbers, but can you give us a ballpark number of uh, those who are susceptible to COVID-19 who have been released from the federal system to the community? Uh, even, uh, is it dozens, uh, hundreds, you mentioned hundreds were eligible, but could you just narrow that down a little bit more for us, please? Well, there, there have been, over the past six weeks, hundreds of people who have been um, eligible and received uh, uh, approval from the parole board for release. A number of those are, are people who were particularly vulnerable. Uh, there are a number of measures as well. I think it's important to understand um, the context of the, of the federal inmate population. Uh, first of all, there are about 14,000 people in our federal institutions. Almost a quarter of them are serving life sentences and not eligible for parole. And, and therefore, we are taking the steps necessary for those who are not eligible for parole. Um, and that includes for almost half the population who are serving sentences for very serious violent crimes. And so we are taking the steps that are necessary to keep them safe within the institutions. There are, in addition, some some inmates who are eligible and who are particularly vulnerable, and we're doing everything possible to expedite their appropriate release into communities. But we also want to make sure that when they are released into communities, we, we are able to provide them with the necessary supports in housing, in supervision, and, and other measures which will help them be successful in their reintegration into community. And so we are, we are trying to strike a balance between the importance of keeping that inmate population which cannot be released safe and healthy within the the institutions and ensuring those people who would benefit from from a, 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 an earlier release are given full consideration in that determination. Okay, and, and just another COVID-related question for the minister: uh, uh, the incident response group met uh, in late January on this matter. Can you tell us uh, whether any Canadian-produced intelligence on COVID-19 was presented at that meeting and? If so, what did it say? Well, I can tell you, the incident response group was convened in, in, in January and then uh, formed the COVID uh, response committee. I serve on that committee and have attended virtually every meeting of it. And we, we consider all of the information that is being provided. I am not going to, to, to discuss um, in, intelligence matters, but I can tell you that all relevant information has, was brought before that committee and received its full consideration. Thank you, Minister. Ceci met fin à la conférence de presse. Merci. And this brings an end to the press conference. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. And you've been listening to Public Safety Minister Bill Blair and the Commissioner of the RCMP, Brenda Lucky, who said that what happened in Nova Scotia over the weekend, that it was a senseless act of violence, unprecedented in our country's history, has occurred, that the focus over the coming days will be to put names to the victims, uh, but that uh, the question was, are there people